My guest today on Joe Public Speaking is none other than Kevin Martin, president of Peace Action and the Peace Action Education Fund. Um, he's uh, a tremendously dedicated uh, activist for peace and social justice, uh, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for many years. And uh, so, Kevin, welcome to Joe Public Speaking. Glad to be with you, Tom. Really appreciate it. So my first question is, it's, you know, kind of trying to, trying to keep it light uh, to, to kick things off, um, is what we're seeing right now in, in these United States or, or arguably formerly United States, it, is this a, an empire imploding in slow motion? I think it is, and I think what's remarkable about, about that is the sort of mass denial about that. Uh, I don't think it should be all that surprising to people, particularly if you've been paying attention to ongoing climate catastrophe, which is having and has been having all kinds of manifestations, including some of the wellspring for the Arab Spring, uh, you know, in 2011 had to do with climate catastrophe and crop failure, et cetera. And, uh, if you look at sort of our political divides that are getting worse all the time, it just seems like we're farther and farther away from what Martin Luther King called the beloved community. And if you look at his triple evils that he denounced of racism, militarism, and economic exploitation, you know, that was in 1967. We're not doing well on any of them. So, you know, it shouldn't be all that surprising. And it's interesting because sometimes uh, I'll use a little hashtag on Facebook that says uh, failed state or, or uh, shithole country or failed society or something like that. The state is actually fairly strong. And we can talk about that in terms of what does that mean, the U.S. position in the world and uh, uh, our foreign policy, military policies, et cetera. The state is still very strong thanks to our tax dollars. But as a society, um, we're hurting badly. And I, I think just about anybody knows that. Uh, and I think if you look at some combination of climate catastrophe, militarism, racism, economic inequality, it, it's just hard to see how this is sustainable. And I, I joke sometimes, and other people coin this, not me, I live just outside of D.C. in a beautiful neighborhood, really diverse, uh, awesome neighbors. The quarantine hasn't been so hard for me, frankly. Um, but what, what I call it, or other people call it, is Rome on the Potomac because that's, that's what DC feels like. It is Rome on the Potomac. We are going to lose our empire as every empire has. And it's a question of how soft can that landing be and what can we look like afterward? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that question kind of um, brings me around to a, a particularly hot topic at the moment. Of course, we are, uh, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head how many how many more days until the election. What is it? Twelve days from today. Uh, yeah, come soon enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's there's so many different possible scenarios out there, and of course, while while some of those scenarios could could be uh, uh, maybe a death knell for for even the notion of democracy in this country, uh, if they turn out to be the, the actual scenarios. Um, there are also some that, that are maybe a little more hopeful, but at the same time, it seems to me that they're, even the more hopeful ones, you know, I, I, I would hope on top of that, that, that people don't just assume that because the orange guy is, is out of the White House, that, that everything's fine and everything's gonna be fine. Uh, what do you think about that? Right, and, and I, I have to think that people need to understand and need to be made to understand that ejecting orange foolias from the White House, that's not the end of stopping fascism in the country. You know, that's in a way the beginning of stopping fascism in the country. That's a Bill Maher, I didn't make that up, orange foolias, I'm not that funny. <laughs> I do think there are reasons to be hopeful about the election on a number of ways. First of all, peace action, which is relatively rare among peace groups that we endorse candidates and, and work on 
uh, elections for House and Senate. We didn't endorse anybody in the in the presidential for good reasons. Uh, we think that that especially the House will have a number of really good young pro peace champions and we've seen that the last few elections and a lot of them and this was sort of intentional on our part to look for candidates young women of color are a, a rising force i think uh for progressives and for pro peace policies in the house now they've got uh you know nancy pelosi and steny hoyer and other old guard sort of mainline uh, democrats to deal with they're not all going to take over uh, the House immediately. But I, I think the House will be more pro-peace, pro-justice, and, and looking more like the country, right? That's one of the things that a lot of people say. Even with all the women that have been elected to Congress the last few years, we still have a much lower percentage of women in Congress than the Iranian parliament has. So there's a long way to go, obviously. The Senate, um, it, it's much tougher. I think the Senate should be abolished. That's not a peace action position. That's my own position. I'm actually in favor of abolishing the presidency and most nation states as well, but that's pretty out there and I don't have any great solutions. Supreme Court, get rid of it. Electoral College, are you kidding me? I mean, there's so many undemocratic institutions. And even though the Democratic Party in and of itself is not synonymous with being progressive, that's where people who are progressive are able to make a difference on the national stage. Some Greens or other independents are successful at the local level. And if we had more um, ranked choice voting as they're doing in Maine, that would you know, make more parties more relevant. But uh, you, know, you do have more progressive voices, obviously, in the Democratic Party who you know, may be able to, to change things for the better. The Senate, um, it's, it's going to be very close and a toss up. But one of the good things is that if the Democrats are able to pick up a few seats and gain majority in the Senate, that could enable some good progressive reforms. Plus, you would have people like Bernie Sanders being, you know, the chair of important committees. So that, that, that could be good. Uh, and in terms of Biden and his foreign policy, military policy versus Trump, it's a total mixed bag. Uh, I think some things would be very good in terms of international diplomacy. I think he would want to reestablish and get back into the JCPOA, the Iran anti-nuclear deal, the Paris Climate Accord. Hopefully, and they made some good noises about arms control with, um, uh, with Russia, which is very important. But we still could have a rising U.S. Pr uh, presence in the Asia Pacific leading to uh, confrontations with China. I think that's a long-term uh, trend that's going to be very difficult to stop. And Biden even said uh, that the Pentagon budget might go up, which is just absurd and ludicrous. Mm. And sort of a good example of the, the challenge of trying to work on these issues. Just a couple months ago, Bernie Sanders and I forget who it was in the House introduced uh, a, a bill to cut the Pentagon budget by 10% in order to specifically address COVID-19 and help people that are hurting, you know, that are in poverty. And 10% cut is entirely insufficient for what we need to do. We need to cut much more than 10%. And yet, it was politically a non-starter. It only got 23 votes in the Senate, but we were actually happily surprised that it got 23 votes. So it's just a bizarre thing when a 10% cut, which is nowhere near what's needed to cure the problem, is considered to be politically you know, wild and, and out of bounds. And that's just the reality of our deep denial about how militaristic of a society we are. And that doesn't change if Joe Biden's in the mic. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, I'm sure that is very true. Um, you know, one thing that I've been wondering about if, uh, you know, if Biden does win and we manage to get the, the orange guy out of the White House, uh, which, you know, we really have to, uh, uh, is that um, I've wondered whether Mr. Biden would, um, either pardon Trump, he may have already been pardoned by Pence or by himself, from what I understand, e either could be maybe a possibility. Um, but let's just say hypothetically that, that neither of those things happened. Um, and the reason why I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about this is just because it, it doesn't seem that long ago to me that, that Barack Obama, who, uh, I absolutely did vote for and, and voted for with some enthusiasm. Um, 
uh, I would have been more enthusiastic to vote for Bernie Sanders, but that's uh, aside. Um, but when he, when Obama first got into the White House, I and a number of other people were disappointed that one of the first things that he announced was that he wasn't going to be pushing for, you know, war crimes tribunal uh, for for W and uh, and Cheney and that whole cabal. Um, when he had, you know, he hadn't really made that very clear. He had kind of been a little hazy on that, and maybe even occasionally sounded during the campaign like he might he might consider it. But then almost immediately said, no, no not going to do it. Kind of a, a kind of a good old boy network sort of uh, uh, reaction. And I think one has to wonder if that is if that's going to happen again. What do you think about that? I've been concerned about that too, but I think my understanding, and I'm no lawyer, is that the Manhattan, um, it, and it might be the Southern District of New York, has a case as long as my arm, and I, and I have long arms, it can't even fit in the screen here, against Trump, and those are not federal charges, so I believe they're not actually subject to a presidential pardon. Now, I think there's all kinds of other ways that that may not happen. I mean, I think Trump needs to go to jail. Uh, I think he, he can or should be impeached. I mean, the Democrats should be impeaching him right now to try to stop this Amy Coney Barrett from being shoved down the country's throats on Monday, right? Um, that's not gonna happen. And I think there is this sort of, the Democrats sort of feel like we have to be the grownups, we have to be the bigger people, while the Republicans, who are clearly a minority party at this point, and only maintain their minority party status because of all kinds of undemocratic small d institutions and structures that the Democrats just don't have an appetite for that. So I think it is possible. And, and of course, what Obama did, it wasn't exactly, it, it, it wasn't a pardon, but it was an absolution. And it was, no, we're not going to go after um, Bush Cheney and company for the Iraq war, for lying us into a war, for torture, for all kinds of things that they could have. It didn't surprise me. I didn't think Obama had the stomach for that. And, you know, I'm sure some people would say, look, if you do that as your first thing or one of the first things you do in office, you're buying yourself four years of headaches from the Republicans, you know, just opposing everything you do. But that's what they do anyway. <laughs> you know, you're going to get slammed for that anyway. So I do have the concern as well that Biden will go easy on Trump. But again, if, if he's up under indictment, which I think he will be, on non-federal charges that are not subject to a presidential pardon, he could still be going to jail. And I'll be one of the loudest people applauding if that happens. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, and, and of course, that could also lead back to uh, uh, Trump himself stating at one of his uh, brown shirt rallies recently that uh, um, he may have to leave the country. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, he's also talking about pardoning himself. He's right, about yeah. pardoning himself. Once, once in a while, he just he just blurts stuff like that out that that actually probably has a grain of truth to it. Yeah, of course. You know, uh, of course, there's been speculation on which country. Uh, it seems to me like Russia would be an obvious choice because he's such good buddies with Putin, and he so wants to build a tower and a Trump Tower in Moscow. Um, but you know, Slovenia possibly. Uh, I understand that his his current wife and child uh, both have Slovenian passports. Right. Right? So who knows where he could wind up? Right. Uh, but that would not surprise me a bit. I mean, and what would what would be frustrating though is is to know that so many of his fans here, even if he split to some other country, I don't even I don't believe that even even something like that would would wake any of them up to the reality of Donald Trump. No, and then they just have this permanent grievance, right, that they that they can't let go of. And, and I don't think there's anything to do about that. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't know. I, I actually have some longtime old friends of mine who are Trump supporters, and I, I can't, I don't even, I try to talk to them in rational terms about it, and I just, I don't think there's any convincing them that they're wrong, and I don't know that that would change regardless. Right. No, I agree. I decided a, a long time ago that uh, uh, it's not worth the, the time and ener energy that one would have to put into it to you even the stress. <laughs> right. Um, so let's let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the uh, uh, parts of the the deluge of um, 
what are kind of attacks on various U.S. policies, both domestic and and uh, geopolitical, you know, policies and things like that. Um, now, you sent me uh, a link actually uh, ahead of our our talk today. Uh, this appears to be a, a story from today from AP. Yes. Um, U.S. urges countries to withdraw from U.N. nuke ban treaty. Not really a surprise uh, under, under this administration that they, they seem to be, you know, trying to withdraw from anything international. Uh, but uh, tell us about this and uh, what, your, what your perspective is on it. Well, and this is unfortunately a good example of the bipartisan nature of U.S. foreign and military policy. And again, as I said before, I think there is good reason to think that a Biden administration would be better on some very important issues that could lessen the chance of war uh, or conflict breaking out. Um, Iran certainly would be one I think that would be very important. I'm not sure about Korea. I do a lot of work on Korea and you know the Obama administration basically chose not to pursue diplomacy with North Korea and then Trump did this goofy bromance with Kim Jong-un thing that typically failed and it failed because of Trump basically his hubris but it's the same superpower hubris that the United States even as we are an imploding empire and maybe even more so wants things 100% on our terms and you can't be seen to give an inch, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, which some people say that's not true on the Iran anti-nuclear deal that the Obama administration, it wasn't just Obama, remember it was uh, six parties uh, that were part of it. Um, so it wasn't just us, it was our allies and, and Iran with the blessing of the UN. Um, but on this particular treaty, the Treaty on the Prevention of Nuclear Weapons, it, it's, quite, um, it, it's quite remarkable and, and on the other hand, it's very unclear what the impact will be. And the Obama administration opposed this as well. Even though Obama has made some good speeches about getting rid of nuclear weapons, one of the times that he said it that was the most famous is he wants the uh, security of a world without nuclear weapons, but it probably won't happen in my lifetime. Well, thanks. If you said that about any other issue, people would say, you're not serious. Let's have health care for all, but maybe not in my lifetime. Let's protect a woman's right to choose, but maybe not in my lifetime. Let's have great public education for every child in this country, but maybe not in my lifetime. People would say, oh, you're not serious. And instead, he got the Nobel Peace Prize, essentially for making a speech about getting rid of nuclear weapons. So just to be clear, the Obama administration opposed this treaty as well. So the, the interesting thing about the treaty, it was signed in 2017. I was actually there for a couple of days. NGOs, non-governmental organizations do get access to the UN or used to before COVID for some of these international conferences and they can be very interesting. And it was great to see all of these countries, many of whom for decades have promoted abolishing nuclear weapons, get together and actually sign a treaty. And the reason they did it was it was sort of a vote of no confidence of the US and the other nuclear states. Right now, the US and the other nuclear states are all a multi-trillion dollar program of upgrading their nuclear arsenal. So they're going the wrong way. We're going, not, a, not just the United States, but we lead the way. We're, all the nuclear states are going the wrong way towards renewing and upgrading um, their nuclear weapons and spending a, a, an exorbitant sum that's not going to healthcare or education or housing or the things that it ought to be going to, right? Just here in the United States, the estimate is $2 trillion over the next 30 years to totally upgrade every part of our nuclear arsenal. Biggest waste of our tax dollars I can think of. You know, let's put a fraction of that into affordable housing in this country and what would that do? Um, the other part of this, and it was part of this article, if you want to go to the, the AP article, is so the United States, and it, it claims to speak for the other nuclear powers, and, and I'm not surprised, and, and it's probably true, that they're trying to get countries to disavow their support for this treaty. 122 countries signed it. The US, the other nuclear states, and most of their allies boycotted even the negotiations. We're getting close, and it may happen in the next few days, to over 50 countries ratifying the treaty. And if so, that means it actually enters into force. It becomes international law. Now, there's no enforcement mechanism. That doesn't mean the US and Russia and China have to get rid of their nuclear weapons tomorrow, unfortunately. It's also a vote of no confidence in the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which was signed way back, 1967. And you get talking about this, and it's like, are you talking about the Peloponnesian Wars and people fall asleep? You know, it's just like, what is this? But it's a serious treaty that uh, it's actually the most um, 
the most participated in treaty in history. Uh, and it's often sort of mischaracterized that it says that these five countries can have their nukes forever and the other countries can't. Well, first of all, four countries have gotten nukes since then, but Article 6 of the treaty says that the nuclear states have to pursue uh, a treaty to get rid of nuclear weapons, and they haven't done it, and it's been since 1967. So these other countries that are already members of the NPT, so they're prohibited from getting nuclear weapons, said, even though that's true, we're so dissatisfied with the nuclear states, we need to have this new treaty. So they came together, they wrote this new treaty with a lot of support from civil society, NGO organizations. We participated, a lot of groups did participate in this. So that's really cool when you see governments working with, with civil society groups. And now it's about ready to become a legal international treaty. And at the last minute, the US and the other nuclear states are objecting. And I don't know why they're bothering. Uh, I can't imagine anyone's going to be blackmailed or arm twisted to say, no, sorry, we signed this treaty and our parliament's about to ratify it, but now nah, we, we made a mistake because, you know, now we see the light. And there's nothing in it for, for countries to do that. Um, so I think in a way, they're just sort of giving us a PR opportunity to talk about how important this treaty is, how wrong the U.S. and the other nuclear states are for not only opposing and boycotting the treaty, but for going in the wrong direction for spending uh, trillions of dollars to upgrade their nuclear arsenals. So I don't think there are gonna be any practical outcome from this stupid letter, but it's not surprising. And it's typical you know, hypocrisy and hubris and attempted blackmail by the nuclear states to hang on to their, their nuclear uh, weapons. You can't call it a monopoly, whatever you wanna call it, oligarchy, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, safe to say that a big part of of this empire imploding in slow motion uh, idea is the the sort of um, military industrial complex thing in the in the form of uh, a, an insane arms race and, and trillions of dollars, I'm sure it's well beyond billions at this point, uh, being spent on an arms race, along with here in the US, uh, uh, a constant flow for the last several decades of invasions and occupations in other countries and supporting proxy wars in other countries as well. I mean, that that has cost, you know, the figures for for just just the 2003 Iraq invasion and subsequent occupation are into the trillions from everyone that I've ever seen. I'm sure Afghanistan is the same, that, that, that invasion and occupation. I think uh, it's over six trillion or something like that and counting. There's a couple really good sources on that. Uh, Brown University has something called the Cost of War Project, and they, they track that. They even have one of those counters that's like continuously spinning on their web page. Uh, it's, it's, it's exorbitant, and it's not just that, it's the human cost and the destabilization of the whole region, and not just, not just Iraq, but Syria, and uh, it's incalculable. And that drives me nuts when people try to normalize the Bush administration, like, oh, at least they're not as bad as Trump or whatever. It's like, are you kidding me? They should all be in jail. They're war criminals. Nicole Wallace on MSNBC, you know, who was the communications director for Bush, she gets to tut tut every day about how horrible the Trump administration is. Like, are you kidding me? Why are you why are you on television? You know, it's just so that that just drives me nuts. And that's just people's you know, we're, we're very bad at history in this country, obviously. Yeah. And then there's, there's the human cost then, too, of all that going to war instead of anything else to uplift humanity in our country and beyond. Right. Yeah, yeah, that whole normalizing thing uh, it drives me crazy, too. Um, you know, when people say, oh, now that Trump's in there, uh, I, I kind of have started to like W because he's not as bad. Oh. Not, not true at all. No. And I mean, that whole administration, uh, W's administration, uh, there's something like 42 um, people in his cabinet, including, of course, himself and Dick Cheney, um, who had been, you know, high-level executives with either direct or, or sort of uh, uh, accompanying ties to uh, uh, the oil industry. Um, so they were the they were really the first, you know, full-fledged oligarchy 
exactly. uh, so to speak. Now what we have is what I would say is the first full-fledged um, fake media administration, you know, uh, just like full of myths and lies and, and general bullshit. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's commonly referred to as conservative media. Um, I can't, I can't stand to even use that term, frankly, you know, it's, it's reactionary, extreme right wing lies and, and, uh, you know, mischaracterizations and you name it. Uh, and so to me, that's, that's also part of, of this implosion that we've been kind of referring to. Um, it, it's just become like all this sort of dementia, uh, using the term in a, uh, uh, in a sort of uh, reference to, to crazy nonsensical stuff that comes out of, out of the White House. There's like this, there's like this sort of uh, loop now, you know, comes out of the White House, also coming out at the same time through conservative media outlets, and then the fans of, of those things repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And it just goes round and round and round like that every single day, 24 seven. So that is, that, that's like a, a major, um, it's like a, a, another virus mm -hmm. in a way that's, that's been rampant in this country particularly for the last four years, not exclusively for the last four years. It really started about 30 years ago. Uh, but, uh, but certainly the last four years, it's been, it's reached, reached a crescendo. Well, and, and the common denominator. And, and so and if you look at sort of where we are as a country economically and, and socially and politically, mostly looking at domestic politics, you know, 40 years of Reaganomics has been devastatingly effective. And the, the thing that goes along with that is fear. And so fear of the Soviet Union, of Russia or China, when you look at foreign policy, but fear of immigrants, fear of this caravan, horde of people coming up from Central America, fear of Muslims, fear of African Americans. And that's why you need guns. And it is a loop, and it's not just a loop of disinformation, but it's, it's a loop of policy that is actually logical. It's horrible, but it all makes sense. It all ties together. You can only get people to swallow this stuff if you keep them in fear, which to me is why it's so remarkable when people step out of that. And so what just happened in Bolivia is phenomenal to me, that after a U.S.-backed coup a year ago, uh, the people rejected that and have returned Evo Morales and, and his uh, party, which is avowedly pro-common good, avowedly anti-capitalist, uh, you know, they've returned them to power, and they're basically saying, no, we're not going to knuckle under to U.S. empire. It takes a lot to be able to do that, uh, but I think if you tell the people straight that you're for them and that your policies are supporting them and not Elon Musk because he wants cheap lithium for his batteries from Bolivia, that was uh, evidently one of the, the key issues underlying all this, it, it's just remarkable that when people do rise up and get together what they're able to do. And that's, that's what gives me some glimmer of hope. Uh, and my version of hope is a little different than most people's. I, th I think most people's version of hope is well, if I do X good thing, I'm hoping for Y good outcome. And I don't think life works that way very much. Um, both Thich Nhat Hanh and Vaclav Havel have talked about this far more eloquently than I could, but it boils down to hope shouldn't be based on your projection of a good outcome. It should be on doing the right thing and seeing people rise up and organizing together and demanding and acting for the right thing. And that should be enough. That should give you hope. And that's what your definition should ho of hope should be. And then I get into arguments with people about this, but whatever, that's my view. And as I say, I'm, I'm far less eloquent in stating that. Um, but you do see uh, glimmers of this. You saw in South Korea where um, civil society rose up and got rid of their uh, corrupt president, and she's in jail now, the, uh, the candlelight revolution of just a few years ago. And a lot of that, it put uh, uh, President Moon in power, and he's been the most important person in driving for peace with North Korea, not Trump, it's been President Moon of South Korea. So you do see people's movements that can make a difference, uh, and, and you've also seen that in some societies that have been able to deal with COVID-19 much better, a, a different manifestation of that. So those kinds of things give me hope. Now, as long as the military industrial complex has a stranglehold over our politics, 
And, you know, Frank Zappa had a great quote about this. Politics is the entertainment division of the military industrial complex. And I think if he were alive today, he would probably reaffirm that quote oh, yeah. or say that even, even more true now. Yeah. But that, that's where I have some real fear because I think you could have an outbreak of sanity and people say, okay, Biden's not Sanders. He's not AOC. He, he has a lot of uh, things that are, are compromising in his background, and he should be held accountable for all the bad things he's done. But uh, he can be expected to focus on trying to get the pandemic under control, uh, put resources into, he won't say a Green New Deal, but they are talking about union jobs that would be green jobs, infrastructure. You know, that's one of the things Trump has talked about and done almost nothing. If Trump had early on made a deal mostly with the Democrats for a huge infrastructure project, he might be cruising to reelection. You know, I don't know. The pandemic, of course, is the wild card in all of that. Um, so the, the concern that I have is even if you do have a turn towards sanity, better policies, both more um, peaceful foreign policies, and of course, with Russia and China, I, I think are the biggest ones. I've talked a little bit about Iran and North Korea, but the big um, uh, potential conflicts out there are with Russia and China. And Russia should actually be relatively easy to, um, to rectify, especially if we would get together with them on getting serious about, if not going towards zero nuclear weapons, at least towards uh, reducing nuclear tensions and reducing nuclear weapons and spending. China is a whole other thing. And I think we're set in for maybe a generational uh, struggle. But even if you do that in terms of foreign policy and a more um, less unjust domestic policies, let's just put it that way, you still have this ferociously strong military industrial complex that might be even more dangerous in decline. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, speaking of generational things and, and and hope, kind of combining those two things. Um, you know, you've you've been involved in piece of social justice work for for many years, and so you've seen a, a couple few generations now in action. You know, hopefully in in nonviolent action. Uh, getting out there in the streets and, and you know, uh, some of the other activities that you mentioned before. Um, what's, your, what's your take on, uh, you know, the millennials and Generation Z? Are you seeing a lot of enthusiasm uh, from them in terms of, you know, I, I realize that there's been huge numbers getting out there related to race issues and, and that sort of thing. And that's, that's great, of course. Um, but what about like peace and so social justice type issues that, that peace action uh, addresses on a regular basis? Um, it's very interesting because definitely within peace action, we have a great core of up and coming uh, young leaders that uh, I have a lot of respect for. Uh, and I do think generally there is a sense among young people that our system is broken. Um, that the so-called American dream is not um, available unless you're rich and white for the most part. Yeah. So young people have a very higher um, bullshit detector, which is always true of young people, but I think um, young people are great at smelling out hypocrisy in their elders. Yep. Uh, you know, I have two kids myself that are 26 and 22 now. When last time you met them, they were little probably. Yeah. yeah. They're 26 and 22 and they're very socially engaged. But I think underlying it, there is a, a sorrow or an understanding that there's no future for them without radical change. Mm. And, and by radical, I mean, I don't think they're radical. They're only radical by the standards of a country that has been under 40 years of Reaganomics. Um, having affordable housing for everybody and health care and food for everybody, that's not radical. That's just humane. That's just what a society needs to do. Uh, but you've had, again, this upward uh, redistribution of, of wealth. It's just been so obscene. And so that's why you have so many young people that avowedly are anti-capitalist. And I think it's great. And, and I'm totally with them. I think capitalism is killing the planet, at, along with patriarchy and militarism and racism and other things, too. But capitalism is right up there. It's killing the planet. And what people are talking about, what Bernie talked about, but others in terms of democratic socialism or social democracy, and, and I don't necessarily want to split hairs about all that right now, is at least getting us toward a less uh, unjust society. Because right now you just have 
a level of, of especially economic injustice as well as racial and, and other aspects that is amazing to me. There was a study that came out last year that said the average net worth of an African-American single mother in this country, net worth, not necessarily how much money is in her pocket, is $8. Hmm. How can we abide that as a society? $8, that's not enough to buy lunch in D.C. anyway, maybe in some other, I mean, McDonald's, I suppose. How can we abide that? Uh, and I, I just think those contradictions are so stark for young people who are not invested uh, in the current structure because there's no future for them. So there's that understanding and that brings an urgency that I think drives their activism that maybe we haven't seen since the Vietnam War. I want to be careful about this because, you know, I'm, I'm an amateur historian of people's movements, obviously. Vietnam War, the nuclear, anti-nuclear weapons movement in the early 80s, the Central, so the Central American Solidarity Movement, the anti-apartheid anti movement. You know, you had a great anti-war uprising against the Iraq War, but I don't think it was as fundamental in terms of either existence or in terms of demanding justice. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think there is a difference. I used to not really get into this, but I think there is a difference between an anti-war movement and a peace and justice movement and what a different society looks like. I think it's probably really been since the 60s that people had an idea what a different, more just society would, would look like and were acting on that. And even then, it was still very sexist. It was still mostly white men who were the leaders, right? Mm -hmm. So there's always weaknesses or contradictions. But I think for young people, there, there is this real... Um, underlying sense that things are so broken and that drives urgency in their activism and I think it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Uh, it, it is one of the things that that makes me still feel hopeful even during these very dark times that we're in at the moment. Um, one thing that I want to kind of follow up on there though is uh, I was wondering when we first started and we were talking about uh, first talking about the whole concept of the, the empire imploding in slow motion. I was wondering if, uh, if our form of, of hyper-capitalism hyper -capitalism was going to come into that, that discussion, and I'm glad it did. Um, of course, now you've got, in the presidential race, for example, you know, it's, Trump is constantly talking about everybody, everybody who isn't part of, of their cult or club or whatever you want to call it are all socialists you know and 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 that's a horrible thing and the, the other day he said at one of the rallies you know that's the the united states will never never be a socialist uh, uh country or never not be a capitalist country or something like that um and you know i i am someone who has always felt as though uh our form of of hyper capitalism that that is so uh, based on unbridled greed has destroyed a lot of things. Whether you're talking about oil company sales uh, that are never enough for for the executives, uh, and and what that's done uh, with the with the emissions of of burning uh, that product. Um, and so, I mean, the list is really too long to. Well, so much so that they've normalized fracking, which is a ridiculous. Yeah. The process, you know? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, but I'm interested to know if, let's, let's say you're having a conversation with an individual or a group of people, and, and they may not necessarily be um, Trump supporters, but they are, they're, they're kind of okay with, with the capitalist system and feel as though people who are left of center will often say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's capitalism that, uh, that is a major part of, of the problem. Um, and, uh, and of course their response is, oh yeah, blame capitalism. I mean, I've literally heard people say that and I've, I've certainly read it in comment sections under, under news stories. Have you encountered that? And whether you have already or not, uh, what, what would your response be? Well, not so much in my work for Peace Action, but more just interacting and talking with people. 
and I think it's it's much more complicated, and, and that's why you know. Um, for me, one of the most formative, uh, formative um, writings about communications in this, you know, modern age uh, was Manufacturing Consent by Noam, Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman. And one of the great points that Chomsky made, and he was talking about television appearances, mainstream media, et cetera, but it, it extends even to uh, just interpersonal conversations, is concision, the, the demand for concision is the enemy of analysis and dialogue, et cetera. Uh, and I like to be brief. I like to be concise if I possibly can. But if people are loaded up with all kinds of impressions over their lifetime about what's bad about socialism, you're not gonna change their mind or disavow them of that in you know, a 10 minute conversation or even an hour and a half conversation. Yeah. Uh, I think there have been some good attempts, and I experienced this a little bit myself too. I hadn't been out of the United States. Well, I'd been to Canada briefly, but I hadn't been to the United. I hadn't been out of the United States uh, for any appreciable period of time. And I love Canada. I'm not slighting Canada. It is a different country. I wish I could go there now, but I can't. Um, <laughs> last year, last year I got to go to the Netherlands for the first time. Belgium, actually, all three countries: the Netherlands, Belgium, and mm -hmm. Germany for the first time. And first of all, just getting out of the empire was like, wow, I can breathe easier just getting out of yeah. the United States. Oh. And I'm not saying those countries don't have their problems. They certainly do have their problems, but uh, they live well and you just don't see the oppression and the greed that you see in this country. And I've, I've talked with friends about this too, who have lived in Europe for a while. And they say the same thing, like we're capitalists. You know, the, the, the Netherlands invented capitalism. I actually think the Chinese invented capitalism, but whatever. Um, you know, in Germany, that's a hyper capitalist country, but, but it's not so oppressive and not so greedy and people live really nice lives. Uh, and I'm not saying that's a, a model that necessarily has to be followed by everybody. And a lot of countries and societies are making their own models. But we just think that we're perfect. I mean, the fact that we think the Constitution that was written mostly by white male slaveholders uh, in 1789 is the gospel truth and shouldn't be touched or should barely be touched. I mean, it's just absurd on its face, right? Yeah. So a lot of it just has to do with our uh, arrogance or hubris. But it, again, it's more complicated because you can have uh, economists that say truthfully that capitalism has been responsible for lifting hundreds of millions of people around the world out of poverty. And that's true. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, you know, most people, we couldn't just all be subsistence farmers. And so markets have helped uh, create jobs for people that got them out of subsistence farming and materially improved their lives. Now, can you do that with protection for the workers, with good wages, um, with uh, protection so you don't get sick, et cetera? And that's where you talk about, okay, it is capitalist, but it's social democracy or democratic socialism or whatever it is. And I just think that's more sustainable. To me, if, if I could really get them to uh, admit this and, and not try to go into long analysis, I would just say, do you look at what's going on right now and do you think it's sustainable? Is it sustainable in terms of the planet? Is it sustainable in terms of oppressing poor people and people of color? Is it sustainable in terms of putting so much into the military industrial complex in a futile attempt to dominate the world? And I don't think anybody could say that because let's just say uh, sustainability is, can, can we continue on this track for 20 years? I think the answer is no. I don't think we have 20 years to continue on. Yeah, but but you don't get into those conversations very very often, and maybe that's the way to do it rather than to try to say X, Y, or Z would be better policies, and they do it well in Brazil, and they do this well in Japan, and they do this well in Korea, and this well in the Netherlands, whatever. It's just like, do you think this is sustainable? And I think the answer is no. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned various protections. Um, that that can and have been applied at times uh, in the past to greater or lesser degrees uh, for for workers uh, and for society in general and the environment and so on. Uh, I've always felt that the so-called free trade agreements, which were supported on a bipartisan level in in the the House and the Senate, 
uh, and and the White House, who whoever was in uh, in the White House, you know, at the time that each one of those came along. Um, I've always felt as though what that really was and has continued to be, it is the leading executives, the the very small percentage of people who lead many of these large companies um, that wound up outsourcing jobs all over the world. You know, they've, they've, they've finally been kind of called on that. But I, I don't hear that many people talk about, you know, what, what was the reason for that? Um, and it seems to me that it's, that it was largely an end run around all of those different worker protections, workplace safety, uh, you know, workers' wages, unions, environmental protections, all of those things that were established largely in the 20th century. Um, and, you know, now here we are, you know, we, we've, uh, we've waved bye-bye to those jobs. Um, and, you know, but again, that's the reasons for doing that were to uh, uh, cut down on costs of, of various types, increase margin, um, and open up new, new markets, you know, in places like China where there's a couple billion people and potential customers. And despite Trump's claims of, you know, bringing, bringing companies back and bringing jobs back, uh, I haven't seen anything that, that really substantiates that as a reality. I think that's all true. And again, that gets to my point about for how long is that sustainable? Uh, you know, for how long are you going to continue to cut down rainforests, which are the lungs of the planet? Uh, you know, you see uh, the permafrost thawing, so it's no longer permafrost. Uh, I was in Montana last year for the first time. What a gorgeous, beautiful state. I'd never been there. And I wanted to go up to Glacier National Park. I didn't get a chance to. They're going to have to change the name because the glacier's melting. It right. probably won't. It's not going to be there in 10 years. Right. Uh, and you can't put a price tag on any of that. And, and look, my God, look at the wildfires now in California and Colorado and other places in the West are just horrible. The other thing about those free trade agreements, which uh, it's great that unions and environmental groups have struggled against them to raise their concerns. But in some of those, and I don't know a lot about this, I've only looked at a few, they're able to sneak in all kinds of pro-militarism provisions that benefit the weapons contractors. This was particularly true in the, the massive one, uh, the, the, oh gosh, the Pacific one, whose name I'm forgetting now. Anyway, there, there was a section in there that most people didn't even pay much attention to, and colleagues from the Asia Pacific region uh, drove, uh, you know, sort of called our attention to, it. and it's like, whoa, we really have to oppose this, not only because of uh, how it's very bad for workers and the environment, et cetera, but it's also great uh, for the military industrial complex. So, you know, they're, they're going to be at the table. That's just the way it is. So the rest of us have to be at the table or demand or, or push our way into the conversation to say, no, that doesn't benefit. And, and how does a new arms race benefit the people of the United States? How does it benefit the people of China? How does it benefit the people of the Asia Pacific region? It doesn't. It, it benefits the weapons contractors, the oligarchy, the 1%, the elites. But even for them, it's not sustainable. At a certain point, they have to drink water and breathe air too. Uh, and, and wouldn't it be better if we were all able to do that? We kind of touched earlier on, you know, depending on the outcome of, of the election, there's obviously different scenarios, neither of which involves, you know, saying, oh, everything's going to be okay now. But uh, when, I was, when I interviewed David Rovix last week, um, uh, who I know you, you know uh, as well, um, one of the things that we kind of were agreeing on uh, is that if, if Trump wins or finds a way to not leave, either by way of the Supreme Court or whatever. Um, it seems to me that the democracy will be pretty much crushed out uh, uh, in this country at that point, and that we were probably in for a very long, long period, uh, and I mean decades at least, of, of America's first full-fledged family dictatorship. Now, this is just my opinion, of course. Um, and that that it will it will 
take a long time to to change that. Uh, you know, if if it ever becomes popular possible, uh, I want to believe that it could eventually. But it seems to me that when you look at at dictatorships around the world, most of them last for quite some time. You know, a number of decades. What what's what's going to be happening in terms of the uh, the sort of tack that that one would take if that that whole dictatorship sort of thing is established? Well, I think one of the uh, sort of immediate things that people should be thinking about is is how to try to head that off in the near term. So there are a number of organizations that are. Uh, engaged in what might you call electric, uh, election integrity or election protection. And, and I think we will be as well, particularly at the grassroots level. I, I mean, you could literally have, uh, there's the fear of a so-called red mirage that on election night, the early returns make it look like Trump's going to win, but it's going to take several days or a week or even more in certain places uh, to count the vote. And then you might have armed terrorists, because that's what they would be. You can't call them a militia. Armed terrorists showing up at the county board of elections to try to stop the vote count. And I think we're going to have to try to mobilize nonviolently, and it's going to be difficult. Who, who are our allies? Who aren't? Are the police helping? Or are they hurting? Well, I wouldn't necessarily count a lot on a lot of police forces, that's for sure. So I think in the near term, there is probably going to be that that need for that type of mobilization and people are getting ready for it. If, if that fails and there's a, a longer term need to resist dictatorship or fascism, we don't have a blueprint in this country of how to do that. Uh, and I can't imagine people are just going to roll over. I also have sort of the reverse concern that if we get rid of Trump, a lot of people will wipe their brow and go back to brunch is the way that I've heard other people say it. And you did see yeah. massive demobilization when Bill Clinton got in after 12 years of Reagan and the first Bush, and the same thing with Obama, massive demobilization. Yeah. I don't think that'll happen this time because uh, I don't think people think as highly necessarily of, uh, of Biden as they did of Clinton and Obama, and I was no big fan of either of them. But also because of what I was talking about earlier, young people, and especially people of color, their lives are on the line regardless of who's president. So I, I don't think you'll see as big of a demobilization, but you might. And you sort of, you know, mainstream liberals or whatever will go back to brunch and we can't afford that. They're gonna need to stay mobilized, especially if you think you have any chance for um, improving certain policies. And the one that I didn't talk about yet, which I will when we're done with this, is Yemen. It's the worst humanitarian catastrophe in the world. The United States, our bloody fingerprints are all over it. That actually started under Obama. Uh, this yeah. huge arming of Saudi Arabia and their massive horrific slaughter of civilians uh, in Yemen. That has to end. Speaking uh, of proxy wars. Exactly. Twice we were able to get Congress to vote um, to severely curtail, it wouldn't have immediately ended, but to severely curtail uh, that uh, horrible U.S. policy, and Trump vetoed it twice. Um, so that could be a very concrete thing that the, the worst, you know, suffering on earth right now, um, Biden has made the right noises, and the Democrats would be pushing him hard uh, to end U.S. support for the, the Saudi-led slaughter um, in Yemen. So that's, that's, I think, the, the, maybe one of the issues that you'd see an immediate benefit. Um, but, but going back to, you know, how do you resist dictatorship or fascism? Um, I know some personally very inspiring stories, including one of my biggest heroes, um, who was a Jewish socialist from Berlin um, in the 1930s and 40s, got thrown in jail by the Nazis, twice escaped prisons in France, uh, escaped and was part of an underground network to help um, Jews and other dissidents get out of France. Uh, when I met her in Chicago years ago, she was a tiny little 90-year-old woman. But what she and her husband did is they took people on foot over the Pyrenees in the dead of night by the light of the moon and stars um, to get them into Spain. And even though Spain was fascist, the border wasn't controlled and people were able to actually get out of Spain to Portugal and get to the US or other places. Lisa Fitco is her name. 
And that's just somebody that I happen to randomly meet and is one of the most inspiring personal stories of resistance to dictatorship and fascism um, that you could hear about. And you can look at other instances in the Soviet Union and China and otherwise. But those are mostly stories of personal heroism, which most of us are not cut out for. <laughs> Although you don't know, I guess, until you get there, you don't know what you're cut out for. Um, a longtime friend and colleague of mine, African-American woman, said she was on a call recently of uh, almost all, like me, was all African-American organizers asking some of these same questions. And that if Trump uh, would get another term or if there is massive violent civil unrest in, in the country, would white people uh, be willing to risk their lives or even die to save black people's lives? And my answer to that personally would be yes. But I haven't had to confront that. I haven't had to do it. So I don't know, um, other than trying to draw on people's personal um, heroism and resistance in terms of how do you organize? I mean, in that milieu, they may cut the internet, right? And then we couldn't be having this discussion or, you know, almost all organizing is dependent on the internet now. So I, I don't have a good answer to that other than we have to do everything we can to avoid it. Because if we get to that, I think our tools of how you resist that dictatorship. And my brother has a joke that, you know, we're going to have 40 years of Trump presidencies. It'll be Don Jr. and then Ivanka and then Barron, you know, <laughs> it's just like, and that's funny, but it's also depressing to, to think about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but I, I do think if people are faced with that, we're going to have to be incredibly resolute and, and innovative in ways that we aren't right now, because we are dependent on things like elections and uh, the mass media, although the mass media is normally not our friend, and the internet, and, and how would you even organize in that uh, milieu? I mean, I've thought some about it, but I don't have any great answers, and I, and I don't know who does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe Gene Sharp, you know? <laughs> well, and that's the thing about, what, you know, what are the, um, the different forms of nonviolence? And it's great to go back and look every once in a while, even you don't have to read all of his writings, just look at his list of nonviolent actions that you can take, and it's, you know, it's pretty amazing. Right. And, and people do have to. But then, you know, over time, I, I'm a big believer in saying that nonviolence works because it does. And that's not just my sort of personal devotion. Um, although the dictatorships or the, or the right wing autocrats are getting better at suppressing nonviolence, um, there's really groundbreaking very solid academic research that's been done over the last 10 years or so. But looking back, um, several decades and also around the world about how nonviolence is much more effective than violence in bringing about regime change or people's liberation or however you want to do it. Uh, Erica Chenoweth, who's a professor at the University of Denver, and uh, Maria Steven, who's at the U.S. Institute of Peace here in Washington, which I'm not a big fan of the U.S. Institute of Peace generally, but this is very solid. And they have done um, very rigorous academic research that shows around the world that nonviolence works better than violence. However, they have shown, I think in the last five years or so, that while nonviolence is still more effective, the effectiveness has been decreasing because of the autocrats, the bad guys, the dictators, becoming more brutal or ruthless or innovative in how they suppress it. So, you know, action, reaction, the empire strikes back, whatever you want to call it. But I highly recommend people that are skeptical about this to, 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 to seek that out. It is really pretty unassailable, as far as I'm concerned, uh, academic research on the effectiveness of nonviolence. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, uh, what always comes to mind for me is the, uh, uh, I, can't think of the name of the documentary right now, but uh, the, in addition to a documentary about Gene Sharp's writing and how extensively that was relied on uh, by a couple of Eastern European countries that wound up, you know, being part of the whole toppling of the uh, of the Soviet Union. Right. Um, you know, that's that by itself is a pretty a pretty good. Uh, uh, sort of uh, acknowledgement of uh, of the usefulness of um, uh, of his writings, and of course, yeah, it was thirty years ago, and it was a different uh, different time in some ways and a different region. But still, I, I'm uh, I'm a Gene Sharp fan, and uh, you know, well, you know, you know who else who studied Gene Sharp? The U.S. military, and the U.S. military actually does, or in the past, I don't know the current status. 
the United, the United States military, because they have more resources, more money than anybody, actually puts some resources into nonviolence. And there were former uh, retired uh, colonels, one of whom I met and heard give a talk, who was advising the nonviolent student movement in Yugoslavia that eventually toppled Milosevic's government. And that's what it was. It was the nonviolent students in Belgrade. It wasn't US bombing. It wasn't Bill Clinton's bombs that got rid of Milosevic in the end. It was the nonviolent student movement. And they were actually being advised by retired US military people. So even the US military, the biggest purveyor of violence in the world, as MLK said, it's still true, they understand that nonviolence works as well. Indeed. Uh, okay, stepping out again. Um, anything else that you want to touch on or? Well, I would just say, and this gets back to a little bit about my notion of hope, which doesn't have to be connected to prognostication of a good outcome, but is when people band together. Um, there are so many forces of atomization in our society that are reinforced by uh, hypercapitalism. Uh, that make it difficult and people feel isolated and alone. And of course, COVID-19 is exacerbating that. On the other hand, um, all kinds of webinars and online meetings and whatnot have been a way, in some cases, for more people to participate. Earlier this year, our advocacy days, both for Korea Peace Advocacy and then also Peace Actions uh, Annual Lobby Days, we had actually more people able to participate because you didn't have the expense of coming to Washington. Now there are pros and cons to that. So you have more people, you know, making connections and, and lobbying their members of Congress, et cetera, meeting with staff. It's not as rich uh, of an interaction as if you're able to be there in person. But, but the point is, regardless of whatever uh, restrictions you're under, technological or pandemic or whatever, organizing with other people is how you get things done. And that's why Peace Action um, while we do have smart people that work for our national organization and lobbying Congress and working on elections, et cetera, you know, our real strength is that we're a grassroots organization and people join together in their communities to demand better policies, but also to build broad coalitions. We didn't talk about that a lot, but I think Peace Action has really evolved over the last couple of decades um, that we're good allies and, and good partners and coalition on all kinds of issues that you might not at first glance say, oh, that's a peace issue or that's a peace action priority issue. So I think regardless of, of the outcome of this particular election, you know, that need is going to be there and joining organizations like Peace Action, however, you know, you feel it's appropriate in terms of your participation is the only way things get any better. It's not sitting back and waiting for some benevolent smart person to save our bacon. Um, I mean, do believe leadership is important and I do believe that as I was saying earlier, a rising uh, new generation of young and a lot of them women of color joining uh, Congress, particularly in the House, can help to make change. But we don't have a lot of time. I mean, I think the clock is ticking very badly on, you know, really on, on human survival. And of course, all the species that we're taking down that have had no say about it. And indeed, our planet is literally on fire. Um, so organizing with other people to demand what's right that's what gives you hope, and I think that fuels and sustains you. Not that you don't want good outcomes, not that you don't want concrete objectives, that this issue has to change, this policy has to change, um, but it's people getting together that I think um, will sustain us, and it has to. Kevin, thanks so much for uh, your time and for joining us uh, today on Joe Public Speaking. Thank you, Tom. My pleasure.